Hare Krishna devotees, please accept my humble obeisance as all goes to Shri Prabhupada. We welcome devotees to our morning class. This morning, it, the class will be on Chaitanya Charitamrita, Adilila chapter 1, verse 59. And we are in the chapter entitled Prayers for, to the Spiritual Masters. And the class will be given by His Holiness Chandra Mali Swami, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. All goes to you, all goes to Shri Prabhupada. Praise to Shri Prabhupada. And it's all yours, Marsh. We are still getting, yeah, the devotees are rolling in. So you can start, Marsh, whenever you would like. Okay. We'll begin. Jaya Jaya Sri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Dvaita Chandra Jaya Gaurabhakta Vrinda Jaya Jaya Sri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Dvaita Chandra Jaya Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Jaya Jaya Sri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Dvaita Chandra Jaya Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hari Lila, first chapter, verse number 59. Tato Dushan Gam Utsrichya Satsu Sanjeta Budiman Shanta Evasya Chindanti Manovya Sangam Upti Bigihi. Translation One should therefore avoid bad company and associate only with devotees. With their realized instructions, such saints can cut the knot connecting one with the activities unfavorable to devotional service. This verse, which appears in Srimad Bhagavatam 11, 26, 26, was spoken by Lord Krishna to Uddhava in the text known as the Uddhava Gita. The discussion relates to the story of Puru Rava and the heavenly courted sin Uvatsi, Urvasi. When Urvasi left Puru Rava, he was deeply affected by the separation and had to learn to overcome his grief. It is indicated that to learn the transcendental science, it is imperative that one should avoid the company of undesirable persons and always seek the company of saints and sages were able to impart lessons of transcendental knowledge. The potent words of such realized souls penetrate the heart, therefore eradicating all misgivings accumulated through years of undesirable association. For a neophyte devotee, there are two kinds of persons who asso whose association is undesirable. One, gross materialists who constantly engage in sense gratification and two, unbelievers who do not serve the Supreme Personality of Godhead, but serve their senses and their mental whims in terms of their speculative habits. Intelligence persons seeking transcendental realization should very scrupulously avoid their company. Umagyan timiranda siya gana jana salakaya chaksum malikami na tasmai shri gurumena maha. Nama om Vishnu padaya Krishna prestaya bhutale shri bhakti bhakti miranta swami tina vinyamaste saraswati deve gauravani gacharine nevishesa sunyavari pasyatya de sitarine. Panchakalpa Tarubis Cha Kripa Sindhuve Bacha Pritanam Bhavane Vyo Vaishnave Vyo Namaho Namaha Daisi Krishna Chaitana Prabhupada Siddhvaita Gadat Har Sivasari Gauda Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare in a dialogue with Lord Chaitanya, Sanatan Goswami asked Lord Chaitanya one question. The question is, Asatsan, uh, uh, what is the first duty of one who is engaged in devotional service? What is the primary activity? What is the primary 
uh, uh, desirable uh, yeah, activity. What is that activity or what is that uh, situation that is the, the most important for one? What is the first business of a devotee? That's, that's, that's the question. What was the first business of one who is desirable to attain the goal of life? And Lord Sri immediately responded, Asat Sangha Tayagya e Vaishnava Achar. Asat Sat Sangha. There is Sangha and there is Sat Sangha. We talk about Sat Sangha, which association of devotees. Asat means those who are not devotees. Asat Sangha. Uh, sangha tiyagya. Tiyagya means to give up. A Vaishnava achar. Achar means to accept or to develop, relate to. One should accept and relate to the, the, the devotees and they take their association. So Srila Prabhupada has also emphasized this. The foundation, now I use that word in a certain way that when you want to build something you have to have a foundation that where you start and that becomes the support of what you're going to build sometimes we talk about foundations in life we, when we think of foundations we think of buildings and the, the basic structures that give the, the building its support so this word foundation is very apical. The foundation for the execution of devotional service is sadhu sangha, or association with other devotees. That is, not, it's preliminary, but it's also uh, essential. And essential means that it is an absolute principle of success. Whereas the opposite is being discussed here, and we have the reference to Uddhava getting this knowledge from Krishna directly. When Uddhava was, when Uddhava was in associating with Krishna, Krishna took the knowledge that he gave to Arjuna and took it to the higher level. So it's called the Uddhava Gita. We have the Bhagavad Gita. What Krishna gave in Bhagavad Gita was very preliminary and basic, but also very essential. He took that same knowledge and took it to another level of transcendental uh, understanding. And that was the words that Krishna spoke to Uddhava. And here you can see one of them. He says, two things that are important in this translation. One should avoid bad company and only associate with devotees. That's one thing. And then what is the benefit of associating with devotees? Their realized instructions can cut through and such things can connect one with the activities and disconnect one from the unfavorable activities of devotional service. So due to our previous association in this material world, we have had so many undesirable or we might say material types of association. Material association tries to inspire you in material sense gratification. That is what it's all about. And sense gratification is not the goal. Yehi samsparsa ja boga dukha yonia evate avantavanta kuntaya nateshu ramate buddha. Krishna speaks that sense gratification simply leads to suffering. It is not the goal of the living entity, nor will it make one happy. Sense gratification is the need of the body, but sense gratification is like salt. Therefore, in order to make your food taste, you give a little taste, you require some salt. But material sense gratification is like Pulling, putting piles of salt on your food <laughs> and expect it to have a taste. There's no taste. Now that's material life. 
And so you need a little sense gratification. We don't call it sense gratification. We call it sense satisfaction because the senses are there. You have the mind and you have the five working senses. You have, I mean, you have the five knowledge acquiring senses. You have the, the six working senses, the 11 senses, the 10 senses, actually 10 senses in the mind is the 11th. These require some contact with objects. And these, when those objects are material, then that, that energy pulls one into activities which are undesirable for spiritual growth. In other words, they're contrary to spiritual growth. Uh, they simply relegate the body to a certain understanding that this is what you need to be happy. And therefore, people are continuously, constantly engaging in and making plans for more and more sense gratification. So this type of association is called here, it's called undesirable, or one should avoid or unfavorable to devotional service. And one should avoid these very strictly because when we say that if you, if someone asks you, well, what are you about? And then you can explain what you're about by who you associate. So we learn about a person by who they associate with. And of course, sometimes we see people come to Krishna consciousness, they have a lot of they're carrying a lot of material baggage due to previous association with the material energy. And they find it very, uh, they find it sometimes they find it very attractive to uh, engage, to be with devotees. But they don't understand so much the principle of association. And therefore, they sometimes carry with them and bring ideas that are material due to their previous association with uh, asat into material life into spiritual life and therefore they kind of mix it in thinking that material spiritual life is supposed to be a higher form of sense gratification <laughs> now that's not totally incorrect <laughs> it's not totally incorrect because the, the, the experience of Krishna consciousness inspires the senses and the mind and the intelligence, and of course the soul itself, for higher and more continuous enjoyment. But that enjoyment is not material, nor does it have a reaction on the material level. In other words, there's no bad reaction to that. It simply brings one's consciousness and all of the senses connected to the consciousness to a platform of satisfaction and peace, satisfaction and enjoyment. And sometimes new people, they can't see the difference between material sense gratification and spiritual happiness, which looks like sense gratification, but it's not. <laughs> It's actually the soul's awakening to its natural state of existence. And then in that awakening, there is some uncovering of the material energy, which has, which has caused the soul to forget what is real happiness and where to find it. So here, and we find in the purport, Srila Prabhupada is giving some clear um, directives and especially he says for neophyte devotees those who engage constantly in sense gratification and those who are unbelievable unbelievable believers unbelievers who uh, are into various types of speculative and mental whims simply to satisfy the senses I think there's a verse in the Bhagavad Gita. Um, I think turn to that verse. It's uh, second chapter, verse number 55. Uh, 
It's an interesting verse, 255. And it just gives an indication of the materialists. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm, Krishna speaks to Arjuna, when a man gives up all varieties of desire of sense gratification, which arise from mental concoction. So here we go. The mind is always creating newer and more types of desires to satisfy the senses. And then Krishna, of course, is giving instructions. And when engaged in devotional service, the mind becomes purified, finds satisfaction. And alone, then one reaches transcendental consciousness. But the first part is the indication that, yeah, sense gratification with all types of varieties of mental concoction. And this goes on in the material world as something new, something better, something uh, interesting. Or uh, Remember there was one, uh, maybe it still goes on, I don't know. They call it bungee jumping. Uh, they take this long, looks like a big elastic band, but it's just some stretchable material. And they hike, they hike it up high on a crane, construction device known as a crane. And it's got a hook on it. And they tie people to it. And then they drop you from this very high point and you fall like directly down towards the ground at a very quick speed, your body weight pulling you down. And, but because the elastic band is like, or well, this, this rope or whatever it is made out of, it doesn't go that far down. It gets you almost to the bottom and then you bounce before you hit the earth. And that's supposed to be an exciting experience. <laughs> and, you know, people pay to be dropped from a crane and just bounced in the air and having this frightful experience of heading head first down towards the ground from the high place. I remember when it first came out, this was back in the 1990s, right? They had a news report and they were showing this particular thing. And the man who was uh, the man who was uh, reporting it, uh, he was a news reporter. But in order to give a what we say a complete report, he decided to try it. And then he could really, you know, tell you all about it. <laughs> and I still remember that report. It stuck in my mind. It's been like thirty years ago. I heard it. He said, that was the most craziest thing I ever did in my life. I don't want to, I would never do that again. <laughs> he wasn't glorifying it. He was telling how it was like idiotic. <laughs> and this was the news report. <laughs> Somehow or other it goes on. So this is what people, you know, this is an example of how sense gratification becomes such a goal in life that people will do anything to experience some kinds of sense gratification. Some people like to kill and cause uh, suffering to others, and they consider that happiness. They consider that some kind of experience of happiness, the thrill of destroying another person. So, this goes on in the material world. So therefore, all of these associations with the material energy leave these residues of desires that take, take deep uh, refuge in the mind and in the intelligence and in the senses. And therefore, we have to, when we come to Krishna consciousness, we have to continually develop this association with devotees. Sadhu Sangha, Sadhu Sangha, Sadhu Sastri Hoi, Lava Mata Sadhu Sangha, Sarva City Hoi, that through the association of saintly persons, and here, what is that association going back to the original verse? 
it talks about uh, getting the knowledge that they have, they that they will give you. That knowledge cuts through this knot of uh, material sense gratification and awakens your consciousness to devotion. It brings you peace. There's a verse in uh, uh, also in the Bhagavad Gita. Turn to the fourth chapter in Bhagavad Gita. The last verse in the fourth chapter, I believe, transcendental knowledge. I think it's the very last verse. I'm not sure the number 40 town. Yeah, the, therefore the doubts that have arisen in your heart out of ignorance should be slashed by the weapon of knowledge. Armed with yoga, O oh Bart, stand and fight. Go to the previous verse. Let me see what that one is. But this verse, yeah. yeah, one who acts in devotional service, renouncing the fruits of material activities and whose doubts have been destroyed by transcendental knowledge. So these two verses both emphasize how powerful transcendental knowledge is. It's like a sword. I think the next verse is the one that says it cuts through the knot of material ex existence, severing that knot. So therefore one has to constantly associate with and hear from great souls because they have the realization and their weapon of destroying the, the attachment to material life and the association that comes with that this transcendental knowledge. Transcendental knowledge is as good as devotional service itself. Sometimes it's seen as a support for devotional service and sometimes it is realization of Krishna itself. So therefore one has to constantly, and I use that word with emphasis, continuously hear and chant the glories of the Lord in the association of devotees Satam prasangam mama virya sam vido bhavanti ritkarna vasayana kata na josina tat tat uvartmani bhaktir ritir anukamishyati. Turn to that verse, that's uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, third canto, verse number 20, chapter number 25 and verse number 25, 25, 25. Really a powerful verse. Satam prasangam mama virya sam vido bhavanti ritkarna rasayana kata tad josanat aspa bhavarga vartmani strada raktir bhaktir anukramishyati. In the association of pure devotees, discussions of the pastimes and activities of the Supreme Personality of Godhead is very pleasing and satisfying to the heart and to the ear. By cultivating such knowledge on one, gradually becomes advanced on the path of liberation and therefore he is freed and his attraction becomes fixed. Then real devotion and devotional service begins. So here is the formula in association with great souls hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. We're fortunately that even though we are limited in, in association due to this particular uh, social and environmental contamination we have, people can associate through the viral. And we should take that association and of course look for association in the physical sense as much as possible. We cannot emphasize how important association is. When Prabhupada was asked, what is the first thing or what is the most important thing in devotional service? Prabhupada said there are three things that are most important. Association, association, association. He responded that way to give the emphasis how important it is because your whole life can change 
simply by proper association with great souls and by submissively hearing their words. And that is important, not only being in that association, but carefully listening and submissively absorbing and, and understanding what they are speaking, then that becomes a purification of the heart automatically. One of the nine processes is a bhakti is to simply hear from the words of the great souls or those who are fixed in devotional service. We can use that word. Those who are fixed in devotional service, we can say that they are, in one sense, great souls and their association is desirable. No matter what their position in devotional service, that's irrelevant. Anyone who's fixed in devotional service, their association is very desirable. What they do, what they speak, uh, all, all are purifying for those who associate with them. So we have to, we take that purifying means getting rid of this material baggage, which relegates one to a hard struggle to somehow enjoy, which is not enjoyable. The material energy is not enjoyable. It's not meant for the living entities to enjoy. It is Krishna's energy. It is divi. It is meant for Krishna's enjoyment, and it has a purpose. Its purpose is to entrap the materialist in this idea that I can be happy in this material world. But there is one, another aspect to the material energy, and it's to de defeat anyone's desire to become happy and live in this material world by creating more and more disappointment and suffering upon the living entity. Nobody wants suffering. Look at the world today. There's so much suffering going on, not only from disease, but so many other problems, so much suffering. And you might think we have so many great people in the world, great politicians, thinkers, and so many people who have spent their, their whole life trying to improve the quality of life in a material way up with newer and apparently better ideas on how to live life. Well, what is the result? <laughs> Look at it. It's very clear. And as Kali Yuga continues, it'll only get worse and worse. So therefore, this is the solution to all problems is devotional service. And Sadhu Sangha is the foundation by which we make progress in devotional service. It not only cuts away the knot of material suffering, but it also brings happiness and peace of mind, which is the, de which is the, the desire of the living entity is to find happiness. Um, so we see, you know, Srila Prabhupada would many times point out that many of my disciples, what, could, what were they before they came to Krishna conscious? Many of the uh, sex mongers and drugs addict, drug addicts and performing all kinds of, you know, abominable activities. And if even if they weren't abominable, even if they were a little bit more pious, still, they weren't happy in material life. Now they've come and they're chanting Hare Krishna, dancing in ecstasy and, and eating nice foodstuffs that are actually beneficial. <laughs> and purifying to not only the heart and mind, but awaken the soul's nature to devotion. So this process of bhakti is very, very rare and very, very spiritually powerful because it completely satisfies and gives uh, total and complete knowledge and happiness to the living entity. And it all centers around this verse from the Chaitanya Charitamrita that we would we were sp speaking on is the instructions of the of the of the uh, of the great souls. The word sadhu refers to a great soul or a holy man, but sadhu also means to cut away, just like in a surgeon when he has to perform an operation, he has to cut away 
with the bad parts that are, have taken root in the person's body and leave the good parts and then this person is again healthy. So the saddle cuts away our, our misconceptions about life and brings about realization of our natural constitutional position is to love and serve the Supreme Personality of Godhead in devotion, which is the ultimate principle of happiness and complete knowledge. <clears throat> so yeah, this, this verse is uh, foundational in our execution of devotional service. And uh, we see <clears throat> that when some devotees uh, somehow or other gravitate away from association with devotees and start again associating with the non-devotees, they become, they again start to pick up their old bad habits and simply forget about the beauty that they have experienced in their time in devotional service. They start to again reevaluate or re, uh, not reevaluate, but re, it's like, it's called, it's called Vantasi, you know, Vantasi is, Vantasi is a very, this, not a very nice word. Vantasi means one who gives up material life, takes complete shelter and acts in devotional service. And then after experiencing Krishna consciousness, again, runs back to material life enthusiastically. It's called Vantasi, and the actual word means one who eats food and vomits the food out and then eats the vomit. One who eats their own vomit, that is called Vantasi. Um, therefore, this material world, uh, Srila Prabhupada was in Mexico, uh, and he was with his devotees on a morning walk. <clears throat> and uh, there was a big garbage dumpster. <laughs> and the, the dumpster had some writing in Spanish on the outside. And Srila Prabhupada turned to his disciples and said, what does that say? And one of the Spanish devotees said, <clears throat> it says, Srila Prabhupada says, place your garbage here and Prabhupada said yes we that this is where the whole material world belongs <laughs> in the garbage dump <laughs> he didn't give it any credit at all and he's actually speaking from the absolute platform of truth <clears throat> material life and material sense gratification material association is like poison to the soul and death to the, to the living entity. And so, but real life, you know, the elixir of happiness that comes with experiencing a, a nice, uh, what we say, fragrant, very tasty and very sweetened drink after being thirsty for a long time is a wonderful experience. Or after suffering from hunger for a long time, one is given a nice feast of uh, pories and halava and chutney and samosas and sweet rice and rubbery and, and parikshit's bread. So many nice things all of a sudden come after being famished for a long time and one starts to feel, wow, this is where it's at. So Krishna consciousness is like that. It's like that big banquet after suffering and from hunger for many, many uh, eons, millenniums. So, and again, here is the foundation association with great souls and hearing the glories of the Lord, the glories of the Lord awaken as we say here, as it says here, it's a nectar, pleasing, satisfying to the ear and to the heart. And the more we absorb ourselves in hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord, that more that happiness 
awakens until it reaches higher and higher levels of ecstasy. So this is Krishna consciousness. It's the only solution to the problems of the world, and it's the natural position of all living entities to glorify the Lord, to hear the glories of the Lord, to associate with great souls and engage in devotional service. <clears throat> it's purifying and it is, it frees one from all suffering and all anxiety. Okay, so we'll uh, stop here and see if there's any comments or questions. Thank you so much, Michael. Such a wonderful class and, a, and this amazing topic of um, the importance of devotee association and being in the devotee association. And I was actually, Christian and I were just going back and forth the past few days, hoping that you got his bread because we never asked you. So I hope you got the bread from Maharaj and it was... That's, that's, the, that's the reason I mentioned it. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you so much. Uh, it's, they were giving me two and three kinds of bread, but I said, I'm only taking one particular <laughs> brand. It's, the, it's called Parikshit's bread. <laughs> <laughs> So, Thank you for giving us so much mercy by accepting the bread and enjoying the bread, Maharaj. It was, it was a Krishna conscious bread experience. Oh, thank you, Prabhupada. <laughs> I would like to ask devotees if you have any questions on this amazing, amazing topic that, you know, I, I'm sure there is no end to it, but please do ask your question. You can either um, unmute yourself and ask a question, or you can just jump right in. Marge, I would like to ask a question, and it was in the Bhagavad Gita verse. Marge, can you speak about mental concoction? You know, when yeah. devotees. Yeah, that, that seemed, at least for me, it's very broad. Can you shed more light on that, Marge, please? Yeah, mental concoction means that the mind starts creating and coming up with different ways to enjoy using the senses and the intelligence. And that you take any of the senses and then you think about how different ways you can enjoy those senses by creating different you know, ways to enjoy those senses. You know, so people are always, they're always thinking about you know, new food items to make the taste buds, you know, somehow or other dance in ecstasy. So they come up with more and more different types of foods. We got, how many types of food do we have? It's like unlimited. <laughs> so, you know, just like, and some of the, some of this concoction actually is abominable for those who have any kind of civility in life. It's like, you know, in some restaurants, they serve aborted fetuses and it's considered to be a delicacy. Yeah, really. It's been going on for decades. It's nothing new. And there's some restaurants that specialize in that particular dish. <laughs> aborted fetuses, yeah. It was popular in France many decades ago it's it's here even in the it's around the world now you can find it in any country oh uh, somebody's come up with that idea for you know trying to tantalize the taste buds and then uh what you know so each of the senses you know let me see what else i can see what else let me see what else I can smell what else I can hear. Concoction means to make, to create something different, something new to enjoy the senses. Prabhupada used to say uh, in relationship to following the protocol that the uh, people like to change for the sake of change. The only reason you change is because it's different. So Prabhupada used the, he used the word, he said, 
He said, walk on your hands, but whatever you do, change. In other words, do something different. Do something new. This is mental concoction. Thank you, Maharaj. Mm -hmm. Are there questions, other questions from devotees that would like to ask on this amazing topic of um, the importance of devotee association? Can I hear a voice? Yes, Mother Gita, please go ahead, Mother. Please, please turn on your videos when you, when you ask your question. Uh, sorry, Maharaj, I'm very sick, so I'm unable to... Oh, okay. But next time I sure will. Please pardon me. I well, hope you get well. Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna, please accept my humble obeisances, our girls, to Srila Prabhupada, our girls, to you. Maharaj, you were talking about being those who are fixed in devotional service and we should associate with them. But if um, if one wants to associate with such devotees, how do we recognize them practically, like in some symptoms or something? Thank you, Maharaj. Mm. Um, yeah, let's see. Uh, uh, Anasuya, go to the third canto. Um, again, 25th chapter. And I think it's verse number 21. Katikshiva mm -hmm. Karunika Suridam. Uh, back to the Sanskrit. Go to the Sanskrit first. Katikshiva Karunika Suridam Savadehina Majata Shatrava Santa Sadava Sadabhushana. The symptoms of a sadhu are that he is tolerant, merciful, and friendly to all living entities. He has no enemies. He is peaceful. He abides by the scriptures, and all his characteristics are sublime. Prabhupada said this is the description of a sadhu. Uh, he says these are, you, you can recognize a person by their qualities, by their characteristics. And this verse kind of illustrates some of them. And the uh, 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 let's see, in the uh, in two or three verses in the Srimad Bhagavatam, there are the listing of the twenty six qualities of a devotee. And I can remember one verse. If you go to the fifth canto. Uh, chapter 18 and verse number 12. I think it's 12. Yeah, yes, yasti bhakti bhagavati akinchinam sarvaguna statu samastate sura. Parava bhakta sikato mahaguna mano ratanasati daivato bahi. All the demigods and their exalted qualities such as religion, knowledge, and renunciation become manifest in the body of one who has developed unalloyed devotional service. The Vasudev, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. On the other hand, a person devoid of devotional service and engaged in material activity has no good qualities. Even if he is adept at practice of mystic yoga, for the honest endeavor for maintaining his family and relative, he must be driven by his own mental speculation and must engage in the service of the Lord's external energy. How can there be any good qualities in such a man? So here's a comparison between devotees and non devotees. And then in the purport, uh, you can go down to this Prabhupada list the 26 qualities of a devotee, one after another, and you can read them there. So there, you can look for these qualities starting there. These are the 26 qualities of a devotee. Kind, doesn't make any enemies, truthful, equal to everyone, doesn't find, he doesn't have any faults. He's magnanimous, mild, clean, without, without possessions, works for the benefit of others, peaceful, 
surrender to Krishna, no material desires, very meek, steady, controls his senses, doesn't eat more than required, not influenced by Maya, respects everyone, doesn't ask for respect himself, very thoughtful and grave, merciful, friendly, poetic, expert, and material, is silent when it comes to material topics. These are the quali 26 qualities of a Vaishnava. So between these verses, you can evaluate based on these qualities, what is a great soul. Thank you. you yeah, when you see these qualities. Thank you, Maharaj. So uh, if supposing such a one devotee has only a few of these qualities, does that all come under like a fixed in devotional service? Um, okay, another verse. Uh, Bhagavad Gita. Uh, chapter 13, verse 8 through 12. This, this answers your question. Okay, these are the listing of 20 items of knowledge. Now, Krishna says, these are the items of knowledge. The people who practice these are considered to be knowledgeable. And in the purport, Srila Prabhupada makes, makes an emphasis. We'll go back to the translation. Uh, he says that the most important of all these is that they accept the importance of self-realization and philosophical search for the absolute truth. These, he says, this is the most important because there are, in other words, those who are engaged in devotional service and searching for the absolute truth or absorbed in searching for the absolute truth. These, this is the outstanding quality. Uh, here, I think that's mentioned earlier, constant and unalloyed devotion to me. That's the one. This is Prabhupada said, this is the most important one. Those who are constantly engaged in unalloyed devotional service to me, these, these are the persons you can take knowledge from. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much, Maharaj. Yeah, look for that. Please get well. <laughs> thank you so much, Maharaj. Thank you. Very Krishna. Thank you for such a wonderful question, Mother Gita. You always ask amazing questions. Thank you so much. Are there other questions from devotees that would um, please? Do either raise your hand or you can just jump right in. I'm trying to go down the list so I don't miss anybody. Maj, I have a question, and um, I think it's one of the verses that you uh, re referred to just now in my Bhagavad Gita. And it's mentioned something about the mind. Um, sometimes the mind you know, not sometimes, I guess, I guess all the time, it runs at the speed of light. <laughs> it functions as speed of light and it's always concocting and creating and giving excuses. And how can we really, uh, you know, how can we really grab hold of the mind, seeing the mind running so fast? Like, how do we retract it, Maharaj? Well, the speed of light is slow compared to the speed of the mind. <laughs> Sorry, much wrong physics point. I was <laughs> and this is this is this is from this is Srila Prabhupada. The speed of mind is the fastest speed anywhere in existence. There's nothing faster materially than the speed of the mind. When uh, when Parasaram was fighting with uh, what's his name? Kartavarya Arjun, he was cutting off his arms. He had so many thousands of arms. He said he was using his chopper at the speed of the mind. That's how fast he was fighting. And then he, after a while he got tired and he slowed down to the speed of the air, which is also faster than speed of light. <laughs> 
So, so the speed of the mind is very fast. And Prabhupada said, you're sitting in your room and then you think, you're sitting in, in Harrisburg and you think of India and you're there. As soon as that thought, it's, the thought is instantaneous. It's even, we can't even measure how fast that thought comes. It's just immediate. And then you're there just by that thought. That's the speed of the mind. So the question is um, how to control that guy? <laughs> There is a way to control the mind, and that is to gauge the mind in devotional service. And uh, don't listen to the mind when it brings up things that are contrary to devotional service. Working for the benefit of others, meditating on the instructions of the spiritual master, these are all ways to control the mind. Uh, don't don't think the mind is me. The mind is simply part of your subtle body. It's an instrument you use. The soul is using the mind, or sometimes the mind is using the soul. <laughs> Depends which one we give priority to. Yeah. So we are not the mind. We have a mind, and the thoughts and desires and emotions that come in and out of the mind. Are our, our, our impressions from the experiences we've had in, in this life or in previous lives? Thank so you. Lord. To control the mind. Yeah. Um, uh, is a nice verse that gives you a little interesting statement. Uh, go to the fifth canto, eleventh uh, chapter. And the last verse in the 11th chapter in the fifth canto, I think it's verse 17. Yeah. There we, yeah, yeah. Maybe you can read it. This uncontrolled mind is the greatest enemy of the living entity. If one neglects it, neglects it or gives it a chance, it will grow more and more powerful and it will become victorious. Although it is not factual, it is very strong. It covers the constitutional position of the soul. O king, please try to conquer this mind by the weapon of service to the lotus feet of the spiritual master and of the supreme personality of Godhead. Do this with great care. Mm -hmm. Wow. Got and my then, answer, Marge. And then Prabhupada's first statement in the purport is interesting. There is one easy weapon with which the mind can be conquered, neglect. Continue. Oh, okay. Sorry, much. I was just really, <laughs> it was powerful. The mind is always telling us to do this or that. Therefore, we should be very expert in disobeying the mind's orders. Gradually, the mind should be trained to obey the orders of the soul. It is not that one should obey the orders of the mind. Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur used to say that to control the mind, one should beat it with, with shoes many times just after awakening and again before going to sleep. In this way, one can control the mind. This is the instruction of all the Shastras. If one does not do so, one is doomed to follow the dictations of the mind. Another bona fide process is to abide strictly by the orders of the spiritual master and engage in the Lord's service. Then the mind will be automatically controlled. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has instructed Srila Rupa Goswami, Brahmanda Brahmite Kona Bhagyavan Jiva, Guru Krishna Prasade Paya Bhakti Lata Beach. One, when one receives the seat of devotional service by the mercy of the Guru and Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, one's real life begins. If one abides by the orders of the spiritual master, by the grace of Krishna, he is freed from service to the mind. 
Yeah, that, that's very con complete in giving us directions on the nature of the mind and how to control the mind. Meditate on that purport. It's pretty powerful. It's very powerful, Marge. It is really powerful. It's concise, but it's deep. Yeah. Thank you so much, Marge. I'm going to make a note on this verse. And that's, that's spoken by Jed Bard. Aha. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Are there other questions from devotees? Any clarification? Okay, this, oh wait, there's, a, there's something came up in the chat. From Namrata Patel, Dandavat Pranam Maharaj, how does eating more or less affect our sadhana? One thing I know is eating more increases tamas. Yeah. And Lee, um, Prabhupada talks about that because it's a principle that needs to be worked on. Uh, one should... Um, Krishna explains that in the Bhagavad Gita, one should not eat too much or eat too little, sleep too much or sleep too little. So that Krishna speaks that directly. Uh, eating too much, one becomes a little lethargic, the mind becomes cloudy, and one starts to experience the lower modes, tamic, rajasic, and tamic. When one eats too little, then it's hard to control the mind. And, and then the mind will become more, what we say, wild. It can come, become more wild, initially anyway. So therefore balance is required. Yeah. You have to give, you know, the mind some some foodstuffs and then that will nourish the body and the mind will become somewhat peaceful. You get too much, then you, the lower modes become prominent, too little, the mind becomes a, a little restless. Mm -hmm. Now for fasting, you know, you're abstaining so you notice when you begin to you do fasting, the mind gives you trouble at the beginning. But if you stay with it and execute devotional service, specifically if you continue to chant, gradually the mind becomes weaker and weaker, and then it becomes more. Prabhupada gives the example, if you, if you don't feed a lion, the lion's in the cage in the zoo, and you don't feed him for one day, he's gonna start growling more. If you don't feed him the second day, he's gonna growl even louder. But if you continue to starve him out, he becomes weak and then he's just a big pussy cat. <laughs> so that's how it works for fasting. But in the day-to-day -day life, it's mentioned to, you know, cause we have to engage in devotional service. One should not eat too much or eat too little like that. So one has to work on that. We all struggle with that. Thank you, Maharaj. Are there other questions from devotees they would like to ask? Did that help Namrata Mataji? I hope. Yes, yes, Mataji. Very much. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions from devotees? Okay, 